Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Technology, Globalization, and Culture. Uh, for those of you who are not part of the course, uh, we meet twice a week in the course and then invite some great speakers. We have terrific support from College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and the College of Engineering and Departments of Mechanical Engineering and World Languages and Cultures. So uh, we're able to bring some excellent speakers tonight. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Tom Gagan, and uh, this is a topic uh, of his most recent book that I'm particularly interested in because for those of you who are in the course know that it has something to do with Germany, and Tom will be talking about that this evening. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Tom's background. Tom G Gagan attended Harvard University where he worked for the student newspaper, The Crimson. After graduating magna cum laude in 1971, Tom worked as a contributing editor at the New Republic until he entered Harvard Law School in 1972. Upon graduation, he began what was to be his life's work as a pu public interest attorney. From 1977 to 1979, Tom was a policy analyst in the U.S. Department of Energy and at that time editor-in-chief of the groundbreaking National Energy Plan II. In 1979, Tom moved to Chicago where he joined the law firm headed by the man who would become his mentor, uh, the legendary Leon Dupre, who for many decades was among Chicago's most prominent reformers and progressive voices. At Dupre, Schwartz, and, G and Gagan, Tom filed suits in a, wild, a wide variety of public interest labor and employment law cases. Tom Gagan was a Democratic candidate for Rahm Emanuel's seat in Illinois' 5th Congressional District special election in 2009. You may have also read some of his work. He has been a staff writer and contributing writer to the New Republic and his work has appeared in the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times, New York Times, The Nation, and Harper's Magazine. His commentary has been featured on NPR, Nightline, Today Show, CBS, Sunday Morning, CNN, and CNBC. He's written a number of books, including Which Side Are You On? In America's Court, See You in Court, and his most recent book, uh, that he'll be talking a bit about tonight is Were You Born on the Wrong Continent? I particularly like the cover of the book, if for those of you who have seen it, uh, got a piece of bread on it that sort of looks like Wonder Bread. And uh, for those of you who know anything about differences in bread between Europe and the United States, uh, you know about differences there between uh, continents. So uh, please welcome Tom Gagan. Thank you. Do I have to stand here or can I walk around a little? Um, I'm not really a writer. I'm, I'm a union side labor lawyer in Chicago and I've been doing that for most of my life. And that's how I became interested in the country I want to talk about tonight, Germany. Because in Germany, which in the view of many, is the most globally competitive country in the world today, bar none, specifically bar none China too. Uh, there is an economy that has the highest degree of worker control over production of any country on the planet, a la Karl Marx. I think that you heard from a professor describing Marxism uh, in the last lecture here. Well, Marx was a German. The labor question has always been a German preoccupation. And now that the Soviet Union has collapsed, where nobody did a lot of work anyway, and what they really perfected was the police state, the labor question is still one of the most important issues, questions, achievements creative achievements that has come out of Germany. 
Before I talk about that, I also want to talk to you about why, for the same reason, since this is being sponsored by the Department of, of, uh, of uh, World Languages and World Culture, why you should be learning German. I started in college because in 1969, like a lot of other undergraduates, I was terrified that I was going to be drafted and go to Vietnam. And I had decided, and this isn't heroic or anything, I had decided that unlike everybody else in the class that I knew, I wasn't going to try to get out of the draft. If they were going to get me, they were going to get me, and I would go. But that didn't mean I wanted to go to Vietnam. And back then there was the Soviet Union and <clears throat> a huge US Army force in Germany. So I decided to take German, figuring that if I learned the language, a NATO posting would be irresistible. And I threw myself into the German language, and they had the lottery for the first year in 1970. And it turned out that I got number 337, which meant that the Russians would have to be crossing the Bering Straits before they got to you in the draft, and so I was out. And I dropped German. Well. Years later, and especially after making these trips there to find out as a union side labor lawyer what it would be like if I had my dream come true and unions really had a huge role in running the country, I, I decided that that was a huge mistake and you should all learn German. My brother makes fun of me for my obsession with learning German. He says, well, Spanish, you know, there are a lot of people there. Chinese, that's the language of the future. Germany, German is the language of the future for this reason. They have come up with a model that turns on its head everything you think about in terms of globalization. What are the two tropes, cliches, I would say, about globalization of the United States and how to confront it? Trope number one, Tom Friedman, it's a flat world. Everybody can compete with us. It's all going to be based on wages. The outsourcing to India, they can do the same things we do. They're just as smart. They're lower cost. They can beat us. They'll be globally competitive. And the Chinese, oh my god, the Chinese. You know, I drove over here with my brother, who's a manufacturer's rep. He comes to Iowa, so we drove down together today. And you know, you go over into these places like Clinton, Iowa, which used to be these great centers for bringing home the dough in the global economy. I mean, they had the auto plants, they had the John Deere's, they had everything, the, and the, the farming. And now you come in and you see this huge Walmart, which has just sucked the life out of the town, full of Chinese imports, and, and a lot of the plants are down, and Iowa is still holding its own, God bless it. If we didn't have Iowa, the US would be a much bigger debtor nation with a much bigger trade deficit. And everybody in this country should be grateful to Iowans. But even Iowa is down in terms of delivering what it ought to deliver for the US in terms of the balance of trade. We've lost out to the Chinese, the Indians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's all, as Tom Friedman will explain to you in his book, which you can get at the airport, it's all because of wages. It's all because of a flat world. Well, Germany has been tied or ahead of China in terms of export sales. Every year since 2003, they finally went into a tie with China. I think officially it was February of 2010 for the first time at 1.2 trillion each. Uh, the Chinese are a nickel or two ahead. And talk about uh, devaluation. The Chinese have been underselling the Germans much more thanks to uh, devaluation than they have the US. The euro has been soaring. The Germans are furious at the moment that the United States and uh, uh, Ben Bernanke and uh, Geithner are, are flooding the economy with money and lowering the value of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the uh, euro. Germany has been tied or ahead. And this is not a country of 320 million with huge natural resources like the United States, number one biggest economy in the world. It doesn't have 1.3 billion people. It's got 82 million people. And unlike the Americans and the Chinese who work till they drop, work, 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 no vacation, the Germans are taking six to seven weeks off every year. That is, they're outselling everybody with one hand tied behind their backs. And don't say that it's just that they're selling to the European Union. The Financial Times, 
ran a big, big, big study survey analytical piece in September of 2010, and I'm just blanking on the exact date, but you can find it on the internet, uh, that examines what is the sources of the German export boom, and where are they selling? Where are the Germans selling? Where do the Germans make their money? China. They're selling huge capital equipment to China, and a kind of engineering skills, too. I mean, they don't just sell machinery and plants. They sell almost a kind of engineering. They, they sell the ability to set up a plant. And Brazil, South America. South America is booming right now. And who's got the market? Germany. We live in a world where we think that our great competitor is China. It's China versus the United States. China, we have to manage our relationship with China. China is beating us. It's the Germans who are taking our markets. But that's not on anybody's radar. Why is it not anybody's radar? I'll get to that in a minute. There is a reason that the Wall Street Journal and everybody else does not want you to know about Germany. China, fine. Low wages, we should have low wages here. They're happy to talk about China, but not about Germany. Fact number two. What's the second trope about the world economy that you hear probably in these lectures? Well, the only way to compete because of wages, et cetera, et cetera, is, uh, oh, I wanted to say one more thing about wages. There's this State of Working America by Lawrence Wischel, Michelle Jared Bernstein, Economic Policy Institute. It is probably the best compilation of data about wages and employment that you can get in the United States of America. They have been publishing it every year. Robert Reich, who talked here, blurbs it on the back. Richard Freeman, great labor economist. They have all sorts of tables comparing different countries, United States, Japan, France, Italy, Canada. And in terms of purchasing power charity, or let's look at uh, US uh, market exchange rates, regular hourly compensation. If the United States is put at 100, Japan is at, oh, Japan is at, uh, in 2006. If the US is at 100 in terms of compensation, Japan is at 85. United Kingdom is at uh, 86, France is at 79, Italy 74, all under the United States at 100. Germany is at 144. It's way above us. So what is the deal with flat world? If it's flat world, how could the number one exporter taking six weeks off every year where they go off to other countries and learn languages and I think the way to become globally competitive is let every engineer in the America take six weeks off and go to another country. Um, why is it that Germany is so far ahead? Second trope, what is it that you hear if you don't hear about wages? What is it that President Barack Obama talks about? What is his strategy? What is the Democratic Party's strategy for getting ahead in the world? And the Republicans occasionally chime in and say this, although they don't say it as much. Education, that's why you're here. Education is the key to being globally competitive. The only way in a flat world to be globally competitive is to jam everybody into college. That's why you're here, right? So the more people we have in college, the better it is. The country that wins in education, that's why it's so important to change our education system, blah, 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 blah. You've heard it all before. So let's look at Germany. Germany, most competitive country, it must be because of education, right? Well, 24, ages 24, 25 to 65 in the United States, the percentage of adult Americans who have a bachelor degree of one kind or another, Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of Arts, even though I wonder if my history and literature degree is really worth a damn. Uh, 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 the percentage of adult Americans who have that degree, 27%, very, very high. Percentage of Germans who have that degree, 15%. Associate degree, let's be more open. You know, community college, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of additional percentage of uh, uh, Americans who have that. I've just blanked on the number, but I think it's something like 30-something percent. Uh, Germans, 22%. I'm not here to defend the underinvestment in education in the German economy. I think it's a big mistake. I think they should invest more in education. Please, don't come out of here thinking I'm against education. What I am trying to suggest to you is maybe it's not education 
that in itself is the silver bullet to being globally competitive. Maybe you could be the most competitive country in the world with the highest wages. Remember we were at 144 versus R100 versus France's 79. With little or no, in it by international standards, with little or no investment in formal education. So trope number one, if you look at the most successful exporting economy in the world today, which I would say given the inflated value that the euro has always had against the dollar and certainly against the renminbi, it's certainly uh, Germany. Trope number two, education explains everything. I don't think so. So why are they competitive like that? What is it that is going on there that allows them to take our markets so that we're running a big trade deficit in the high wage, high value engineering type things where we ought to be cleaning up in the world? Why are they cleaning our clock? We have all the advantages. We have the natural resources. We're the United States of America. We have flexibility. We have far more labor market flexibility than they do. How can they possibly be beating us? Well, maybe it's socialism. And by socialism, I mean European social democracy and the particular form that is taken in Germany. And that's the thing that we don't want to talk about, partly because if Americans figured out the most globally competitive country is actually the country with the highest wages and the highest benefits, or that education really isn't the key, um, it might change the debate radically in this country about what is going on in globalization and what technology means. And in terms of technology, why is it that Germany is poised and self-confident and very cocky, and you've got the president of Siemens saying, we're going to lead the next industrial revolution. We, the Germans, the green technology, baby, it's ours. It's not going to be Americans. It's not going to be Chinese. Why are they so confident about that? So I'd like to talk a little bit about three aspects of the German economy that I think make it highly competitive and that are completely different from the United States. And I want to start out by saying I'm not in favor of the old-fashioned state socialism. Germany is a capitalist country. What I want to argue to you is that the part of it that is socialist is that we're a socialist country too. We have a mix of capitalism and socialism. And that they're doing both the capitalism part and the socialism part better than we're doing our capitalism part and our socialism part. That's the difference. Let me start with the three big things that I think distinguish the German model from the United States model. And I'll talk incidentally about China, East Asia as a standard of comparison later in terms of the corporate models. Point number one, in Germany, human capital has some, and I want to say it's very, very, very limited, but it has some control over financial capital. That's a big clunky kind of thing that you cart out at university lectures. And what it means more specifically is that they have not just labor unions, and not labor unions like the, in the United States, I should say, uh, but uh, works councils and co-determination and forms of worker representation separate from and outside of the uh, unions that all add up to a different kind of corporate model, a stakeholder model, as it's called in Europe, as opposed to a stockholder model, which is the United States, as opposed to authoritarian corporate model where the government is in control in China. And if you keep in mind those three corporate models that are competing in the world today, the authoritarian one where the government is in charge, where if Gordon Gecko over in China starts to loot the company, he's taken out and shot by the authorities. Uh, the stakeholder model where you have workers on the board who are sitting there like Cato the Elder watching the corporate executives as they make decisions and having to have some of them pass through them. And the US stockholder model where the CEOs and the directors are basically on their own. Nobody's watching them. Even the mutual funds, which are globally dispersed, aren't putting much of a check on them. Those are the three different models that are competing in the world today. 
What is interesting about the German model is the role that workers have at, in three different ways in controlling what's going on by that company. First, let's start out at the basement, the bargain basement. And in the book I wrote, um, I took for the heck of it Barnes & Noble or Borders Bookstore. It's kind of a ludicrous example, but I'll start with it here. Uh, we could do a Starbucks. Uh, let's start with a retail outlet like Borders. You're in Germany. You have the right to put in a works council at your local store. And what that means is that you can elect employee representatives on this works council. And once those people are on the works council, management of the border store, the store, at, whether it's Diversity and Clark in Chicago or downtown Ames here, management has to enter agreements with that works council. It's not like they can blow them off like here in the US. They have to enter agreements with them as to things like what time people start, if there's going to be a layoff, who's going to be laid off. They have to cut a deal with the works council. So a lot of management functions are performed, not exclusively by the workers, but the workers have a total veto as to how they're performed. That's at the store level. Let's go up to Borders Worldwide Global, or Barnes & Noble Global, and let's assume that there are over 2,000 employees. At that level, you, the clerk, I mean, you may just be the clerk brought in off the street, although, of course, in Germany, being Germany, you know, if you're brought into a bookstore, you probably have to have a certificate that you've, uh, you know how to run a bookstore, you know how to operate a bookstore. Of course, here we just take in anybody, we take in anyone. Uh, you elect one half of the board of directors. It's called the supervisory board, and it's not quite like the board of directors in the US, which has more executive powers. This is a, a real uh, supervisory board that, that makes only, only cosmic sort of decisions. But half of the people on this board are made up of employees. So you could have a bank like Fifth Third Bank or something like that, uh, or Citibank. And the employees could elect the person, the man or woman, who waters the plants around the place. They can elect anybody. They can elect whoever they like. And literally, at one bank, when I was there, the employees of the bank had elected the gardener of the bank to the board of directors. And I talked to the bank vice president, who was one of the people who elected him, and I said, uh, what do you think of that? He said, I think it's pretty funny. Um, the um, global corporations have people on the board of directors, think about that, who have high school degrees. I mean, they didn't even go to community college, they didn't go to Ames, uh, um, they didn't go to uh, ISU, they didn't go anywhere. They're, and yet they're sitting on the board of directors of some of the biggest global corporations in the world as directors. Why? They're not there for life. They were elected by the workers. What are they doing? Watching management. Now, I've got to say that, there's, that the votes are 50-50 between the shareholders and the, and, and the workers, but if there's a tie, the shareholders get to vote twice. They have a chairman of the board, they elect a chairman, and the chairman has a double vote. So in the end, the shareholders can always win if they keep a united front. But sometimes there's debates or splits among the stockholders as to who's going to be running this company or that company, and so the workers cast a deciding vote. The third thing is the unions, and I won't talk about the unions because they're very, very interesting. They aren't like the unions here. The unions in Germany are not part of the corporation. I've been talking about employee representation within the corporation. The unions are outside the corporation completely. The people who are on the works councils and on the corporate boards may be union people or they may not be union people. They've run for office on their own. They've been elected on their own. The unions do all the wage bargaining. None of the wage bargaining is done within the companies by the works councils or by the board of directors. It's done by the unions outside. And the unions, unlike the unions here, have a goal, a mission, which is to make sure that everybody gets the same as much as possible, what they call wage compression. So until recently at Lufthansa, the pilots have now finally split off, 
but the pilots would negotiate with the maids, you know, the women who would come in and clean up the uh, uh, crap off the planes when they landed. They would be in one bargaining unit. And the ideal would be to keep their wages as close to possible. Now, that hasn't happened. That system is collapsing, in some say, eroding, others say. But in some way, it's still intact. They try to put in wage agreements that are general across the board. And that's all they do. Everything else is handled inside the corporation by the workers. The workers decide you know, when they're going to open, when they're going to close, who's going to get laid off. They have these huge rights to get all the information they want from the company. They're sitting on the board of directors. They can rifle through the files the way no American employees can dream of. Um, but the unions set the wages. The, the employees can uh, change the allocation, some of it more pension, some of it more wage, but it's done by the unions outside. Now, these unions aren't like unions in the United States. We have these big pitch battles, Norma Ray, et cetera, et cetera, and they're big pitch battles because workers are brought into unions and then they have to pay. They pay dues out of their own pocket. They don't have any choice about it. They can go on fair share, but they're paying out of their own pocket. In Germany, it's all volunteer. So when they say that 25% of the German workforce is in unions. That's 25% of people who would get all the benefits of union bargaining anyway, have no need to be part of the union, doesn't do them any good financially or otherwise, but still pay dues because they believe in it. I went in April 2009, talked to people in the SPD, the uh, Socialist Party, uh, uh, the uh, left-wing Socialist Party, which Gerhard Schroeder uh, was in and was in the coalition with Angela Merkel of the CDU. And I was just amazed uh, about the number of government officials that I would run into who were union members. Um, you know, try to imagine Barack Obama or Tim Geithner being a union member. They would take out their cards, they subscribe to the union magazine, and they would sit there and talk to me just the way union members talk to me in my office, which is, I'm so sick of my union. They aren't organizing uh, the uh, security guards. What the heck are they doing? Who's in charge over there? You know, it's, but it's all voluntary. So that's the system. And while it's quite true that under co-determination, the Germans outsource like crazy, they've sent the assembly lines to Morocco, it's just like the United States in some ways, but every time they make one of those decisions, there's something called conditions, 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 uh, on the board, with the workers in the room looking at them straight on, deals are cut. Yes, we're sending out the whole damn assembly line to Indonesia, but we're going to put more money into our plant in Bremen. And we're going to keep making things here. Now, they don't make things necessarily in the way they used to if you go to companies like Bosch. You've got people who have gone through the vocational education system not going through universities who are being taught to be quasi-engineers. And the Germans really have to come up with a new system that is going to uh, bridge this gap between vocational education and university education, and they're struggling with it right now. But they're working at a very high degree of sophistication without university degrees. Uh, and that's because they have a corporate structure that has kept the capital in the country. It's not like the United States with which I am sadly very familiar as a union side lawyer because I go to bankruptcy court a lot. What happens is, and it's been happening 1979, 1989, 1999, it goes on today. <clears throat> they take the plant, they move it to the Louisiana, they bring in people at $8 an hour, we start making crap instead of high quality products, somebody complains, uh, there's a big mistake, the company goes bankrupt, we're in bankruptcy court, everybody walks away with tons of money. Or they flip the companies, or they loot the companies. There's no check on that. As I said, in China there's a check. You get shot. In Germany, literally, in Germany you can be criminally prosecuted. Uh, you know, there's a famous story about what, uh, uh, you know, I'm blanking on his name, the guy who's now the head of uh, a global, uh, who's the head of Deutsche Bank. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. He was criminally prosecuted because he gave a severance bonus of about two or three million to one of his colleagues in connection with the Manus Man buyout. You know, it's just jaw-dropping. You can't imagine that happening in the United States in a million years. But it happens there. And it happens there 
because there are workers on the board of all these companies. As I said, they can't stop outsourcing. They don't. They can't stop this globalization. They don't. But they have an enormous amount of mm, bargaining power about putting conditions on sending the low wage, uh, less highly qualified work to uh, uh, other places. Now, people could say, well, this is all very politically correct, but aren't you really missing the real point? The real point is that the Germans just are into engineering and they're really good at it and they're uh, very efficient and it's all national character because somebody said that on a post on the internet the other day about my book. Is there a first person to say that? I've been waiting for someone to say that. If that's the case, if it's just, oh, well, they're Germans, then there are two reactions to that. One is, it's true, in which case we ought to organize our workplace the way people who are interested in being efficient organize their workplace. Or it's not true. That is, they aren't more efficient than we are, in which case it is the way that they organize their workplace that makes them more efficient. But it certainly doesn't make sense that it's in their character, because if it were in their character, why are the CEOs and the others playing along with it? Why don't they just act like American CEOs? Why don't they just outsource and do what Americans do? It's the structure that has changed it, and it's kept a commitment to manufacturing and lower profits during an age when financialization went out of control, when all the foreign capital in the world went to London, to the United States. Remember the bubbles here in the United States? Uh, they ended in 2008, but some of you will remember what went on in this country from about 1990 up through 2008. Money coming in like crazy because, in fact, we were running a deficit, so all these people were holding dollars, and they poured them back into the American economy, which wasn't making anything, but we didn't care because we were all going out to Walmart and consuming and buying houses, and we were happy to take out loans, which were cheap coming in from foreign companies. So we stopped making things and consumed more and more and more and more. Germans don't do that. Why not? Well, I gave you one reason. I wanted to uh, uh, hit two other reasons why I think they're especially competitive. I talked about the fact that Germany is capitalist and they do capitalism better. They're also, uh, do their socialism better. Now, the United States does just as much socialism or more than Germany does. I mean, if you look around at our economy, what makes it go? It's entitlements. You know, what is it that's going on in the Midwest, and Iowa accepted, that has any hope of a springtime at all? It's the healthcare complexes, it's the medical centers, it's Cleveland, it's St. <laughs> Louis, it's Chicago. If you go into these cities, the only thing that's happening is medicine. And where is that coming from? The federal government is paying for the whole thing. The other thing that is happening that is signs of hope is education. We have big universities. We have the best universities in the world. Iowa State University, Iowa University, just in Iowa. I mean, it's a university mecca. Universities, universities, universities. Where is that coming from? It's all the government. Much more money is shoveled into these two areas, health, and education by the government with tax dollars than the Germans are doing, I can tell you that, far more. And that money is often put on top of our manufactured goods, which make them less competitive. So healthcare costs, I mean, we don't insure everybody, not even close, but we have spectacular healthcare costs. It takes up 17% or more of our GDP in Germany, which has the most outrageously high healthcare costs in Europe, takes up 11%. Um, but the Germans, more and more, having that paid by the central government directly, we have it put on top of cars and Fords and uh, General Motors and so forth. So what is significant about the socialism part is that they deliver the socialism more efficiently. It costs them less. They deliver public goods without allowing the private market to profiteer off it. Your tax dollars go to sustain a medical system and to a greater and greater extent an education system, ISU accepted, that is based on paying off private market vendors at a profit. That is a terrible way to run the socialist part of your economy. It's destructive, it leads to debt, it's stupid, and on top of it, 
you end up not only with people paying more taxes than they should for delivering these public goods, but they still, at the end of the day, go bankrupt trying to buy them through their own private means. You know, think of all the people who pay money for Medicare who are ending up in bankruptcy court because they can't afford health care because their deductibles are going up. It's incredibly stupid. But it's the way we work here because there is no understanding in the United States that you cannot deliver public goods in the 21st century like education and health care by allowing the private market to profiteer off it. Nobody does that in Europe, not in France, not in Germany. They have strict cost controls across the board. Uh, they don't have uh, private profit systems working in any way in any of these areas, whether it's education or um, um, uh, health care. And so the costs they, do, they provide public goods far more efficiently. The third difference is that they have a mercantilist class that runs these countries. And I, uh, what I want to say is the old-fashioned mercantilists were people who wanted to have a favorable balance of trade. They're committed in Germany and in every European country uh, north of Milan to a, uh, running a trade surplus. And they will do what they have to to make that happen. And one of the things that they will do is put some controls on the financial sector. Uh, that, so for example, the Germans, they have big global banks that behave just as badly as our global banks. But they also have government banks that are set up throughout the system, which provide credit cards at, at non-usurious credit card rates and provide all sorts of protections to keep people from getting into debt. So they have control over the financial capital. They have some efficient way of distributing public goods that doesn't lop on top of their manufactured goods to make them uncompetitive the way we do. Think of Ford, General Motors, other uh, countries which are weighed down by retiree health costs. They have a political class, and that could be the Christian Democrats as well as the Social Democrats, who are committed to promoting industry. And that means, let's face it, it means clamping down on the financial sector to make sure that you don't financialize the economy and have all your growth in Wall Street. They're willing to do that. Our political class is not. Uh, look at the bailout. Look at the money that we've spent uh, in the bailout. Where has it gone? It's gone. Uh, everything that uh, Obama, who I love, I'm a loyal Democrat, has done, has been to bloat up three sectors, banking, education, health care. Those are the answers. Well, we're just going to be more uncompetitive. I mean, it's just the opposite of what the Europeans would do, and the Germans in particular. The fourth thing that I think is really important, and that we nag the Germans about, they don't spend enough on consumption. And th this is a way in which the 17th century of mercantilism ties in with the 21st century of green technology. What is it that the mercantilists did? They discouraged consumption and encouraged investment. They discouraged people from luxury consumption at home and encouraged investment in goods that could be sold around the world. That's what the mercantilists did. The Germans, and to some extent the Swedes and the other Europeans, do the same thing. They don't use trade barriers or any of that. They try to direct, do what Keynes said, they try to induce investment into things that they can sell around the world. And they try to discourage invest in consumption. Do you see how the green business ties in? The one final aspect that makes Germany competitive, in my view, and I've not been able to explicate this enough, and it's up to you guys to go out in your adult years and figure this out, but I'm convinced they're on to something. Anyone who goes to Germany comes away with one huge impression. Germany is green. They are huge on the environment, not consuming, not wasting, <coughs> delivering public goods efficiently, delivering people around the country efficiently, to make sure that people don't have to go out and spend, that they don't have to go out into debt. Uh, that is a throwback to the old mercantilism where countries like Spain and France, et cetera, would discourage consumption and encourage investment in stuff they could sell abroad. 
Well, the Germans discourage consumption and encourage investment in the kinds of things that you can sell in China, Brazil, and elsewhere. And that difference is one of the things that makes them competitive. The fact that they're not consuming, we're upset about. But folks, you know, we live in an age of limits. The earth is heating up. The Europeans are acutely conscious of this. The Germans, which destroyed the world once and destroyed their own country, literally burned it up, really have, have this traumatic, deep, inner sense that you don't destroy the planet and that you conserve, 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 you don't consume. And if you're going to have economic activity, why have it at home, uh, you know, uh, drinking Slurpees, taking the stuff out of Archer Daniels Medlin, supersizing your Coca-Colas, why not be selling capital equipment, engineering equipment to Brazil, to China, to the countries that are trying to climb their way out of poverty into a better life for their people? Why not do that? Why is it so bad that the Germans, although the Americans are horrified by it, you know, Geithner's upset, Obama's upset, why is it so bad that they're not consuming? That does make them more competitive, but I want it, and, and we're horrified by it. Oh, yeah, the Germans, they're just not running up their consumption enough. Uh, it's terrible for the world economy. No, it isn't. It's good for the planet. It's good to be focusing on things that you can sell abroad to countries that ought to be coming up to our standard of living. And it's a model of how you be successful in the world economy without bloating yourself up in a way that imposes huge environmental costs on not only your own country, but the planet. And that's a final factor, I believe, in why they're competitive. I don't know whether or not they're going to be the leader of the next industrial revolution in green technology. Maybe they won't be. But the fact that they are green and discouraging this consumption and pushing their efforts into uh, exports is one of the things uh, that leads me to urge people, even though there's no war in Vietnam, even though there's no draft, to think about learning German and to look at this country which turns upside down on its head all the things, oh, it's a flat world, oh, education is what makes you competitive, all the things that we walk away uh, with here and use as a substitute for thinking hard about the world economy today. Thank you. And if you've got questions, fine. And if not, I may ask myself some questions. So, yeah, way in the back. Oh, um, why is it that workers are on the boards? Why is it that there's co-determination? Uh, the reason is the United States of America. We set it up. Uh, there are really three possible explanations as to why they have it. But the one I like best is that the Allies did it. After World War II, the United States occupied Germany. Dwight Eisenhower was the commander-in-chief. Lucius Clay was the head of the occupation. Clay and Eisenhower thought about prosecuting all the Nazi businessmen who had helped Hitler. They decided instead, too many trials. What we'll do instead is put workers on the board to watch them. So they pushed co-determination, but they didn't really invent it. Um, it came out of Catholicism. In 1893, Pope Leo XIII wrote an encyclical called Rerum Novarum. And it was a conservative church's reply to both Marxism and laissez-faire capitalism. And the reply was that what had to be put in place for social justice through labor unions specifically. It didn't mince the words. It got to put in unions. Under Pius XI, he's the good Pius, Pius XII is the bad Pius, uh, there was an encyclical called, called 40 Years After, which actually laid out the case for works councils. 
the church has never been nuts about unions. They really do like the idea of workers having some sort of control over the produ means of production. They still do. Benedict the Sixteenth is a good German. He just wrote an encyclical, which nobody paid any attention to about a year ago, where he complains about outsourcing. Um, but the Christian Democratic Party was founded in 1906 in Brussels, and it became the right-wing party, and it was set up as a study group of the papal encyclicals. It became the right-wing party of choice after the Nazis and the, uh, were discredited, I would say, to say the least, in 1945. So you had a right-wing that was pro-works councils, and you had a social democratic uh, opposition, which was pro-union. And so from those two sources, the Social Democrats were committed to um, <coughs> unions. I mean, if you go into the SPD headquarters in Berlin, that's, you know, it's like, they're like the Democratic Party in Germany. They're often in the government. They've been in the government for, they ran the government for most of the last um, 10 years, I would say, or a half. The first thing you see when you come into what is like the German Democratic Party headquarters, the first thing you see in the lobby is a huge picture of Karl Marx. Karl Marx, can you imagine seeing that in the Democratic Party headquarters in Washington, D.C.? No way. So it's, so you've got this Catholic Party, originally Catholic Party, uh, and, and a Marxist party. They think of themselves as Marxist party, which divides the fields between them. And remember, these are Germans who, who couldn't seem more like Americans when you see them. But their political terrain is that, that, and they have the Green Party. Uh, the third um, um, thing that I think really uh, uh, explains why they have social democracy is, of course, uh, that they do have this long-time Marxist party, which is now very democratic and very uh, capitalist in every manifestation, but they still remember their roots. And the, even as unions have become weaker in terms of economic bargaining, and German unions are much weaker, the SPD, by legislation, has expanded the Works Council. So that in, while they've lost bargaining power over wages, they have more political power within the corporation. So it comes out of the uh, socialism, the, the Catholic Church, but really and truly, it comes out of the United States of America. You know, we were a social democracy when Germany was, to say the least, fascist, authoritarian, monstrous kind of place. We were Athens when they were Sparta. Now they're sort of more like Athens and we're a little bit, I'm afraid, more like Sparta. But it is the United States of Franklin Roosevelt, which fought the war for freedom of fear, freedom from uh, insecurity, uh, freedom from economic scarcity. Those New Deal goals were enshrined in the German Constitution and other European constitutions that were created in 1945. So what the Europeans have is the American New Deal, which we abandoned and they kept. And to go over there, to go over to Europe today, is to see the United States of America, a la 1940, projected back how it would have turned out had we just kept on the same path as the New Deal had charted. All answers will be much shorter from here on. Uh, well, I've got a question for myself. Oh, uh, over there. I'm sorry. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about green technology in Germany? Uh, does that just mean they emit less CO2? Um, uh, I mean, certainly they don't, they don't emit less than France, which uses all nuclear. Can well, you just I'm, go more into I'm, that? I'm very aware that I'm uh, with people who have a great understanding of technology, and I don't. Um, what I can tell you is that... Uh, Germany is, uh, I mean, you know, aside from the fact that they've got windmills and everything else, which we have here, they have a political party, the Green Party, which is not like the Green Party in the United States. I mean, it's, it's a serious major party. I'd probably be in it if I were over there. And 
it is committed to pushing a country that uses less and less energy, CO2 emissions. I mean, all the impetus for the global treaties, the carbon uh, emissions that comes out of Germany and Northern Europe, Norway, Sweden, places like that. Uh, and they also think, and I know this just from reading the business press, Siemens technology, uh, Siemens uh, president is, uh, who I quoted before, is, has made this very famous statement that they, because of their engineering skill, they're much uh, farther along and committed uh, to environmentally friendly technologies than any other country in the world. And it makes sense given their corporate structure and the interest in keeping manufacturing within the company um, that they would do that um, because the lower, dirtier stuff gets outsourced, they keep the cleaner stuff. I, I, I'm a lawyer, I'm not an engineer, I'm not technology. I have a niece who's an engineer, but I, I'm not. Uh, what I do know, uh, just from eyeballing the place in 1997 and now is, I mean, you go around and you see the German plants and it's just bizarre how immaculate they are. The country's immaculate, but the plants are immaculate. You know, it, it, having just driven through Clinton, Iowa uh, this morning, <laughs> just, I mean, you, you can't imagine anything like that in Germany. It's so clean. And I think that um, that is part of this ethic that is just driven into people all the time about uh, responsibility to the country, to the planet. Um, if you take a train in Germany and go from Frankfurt to uh, Berlin, uh, or certainly in East Germany especially, I mean, you hit large parts where it's like the sound of music with no Julie Andrews in the field. You know, I mean, it's just nothing. It's just all green. It's green, 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 green. Then kaboom, you're in the city. Um, so I'm punting on your question. I don't know exactly where they're um, uh, putting, what, what the technological breakthroughs are in, 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 in green or other technology there. I do know that they are much more in country and companies like Bosch, they're much more interested in not just making things, but in making processes that can be reduplicated in other countries on an ad hoc basis for a particular company that's not, that can't be replicated. Um, and that's about the limit of my knowledge of their technology. I'm sorry to be, yeah. Um, after, a little, uh, after a little financial fiasco a couple years ago, to your knowledge, do you, uh, American corporate companies, are they adding another safeguard to uh, add the checks and balances to watch their people to make sure they don't make mistakes? Well, the question is whether the, there are, there's been a change in the U.S. corporate model. And the answer, I'd say, is basically no. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that the corporate model here in the U.S. has failed. Why has it failed? Well, there's no check on the looting. You know, there's no check on, here, let, let me give you an example of a company that I was thinking about suing and then decided it was just too hard to go after them. Uh, Simmons Betting, I think if you can find the story, it's probably in the October 2009 New York Times. Julie Cresswell did a long front page story. Um, uh, a firm, Thomas Lee, private equity firm, came in. This was a solvent company. It was just terrific. It was doing great. Um, they bought the company, and then they leveraged the company, uh, put it in awful debt, to pay them back the purchase price plus a huge profit. So they came in and took a solvent company and then said, well, we're going to uh, issue bonds now. And what are the bonds for? They aren't for investment. They aren't for making Simmons Betting Company better because Simmons Betting Company is pretty good. You know, everything's going along just hunky-dory. The bonds are to pay us back the purchase price of the company plus an in investment. And once they got that in, they flipped it and sold it to a, 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 another group of buyers. And this went on and on until 2008 came along and it, you know, the whole house of cards came down. This company, which was solvent, went bankrupt. It went bankrupt because they were constantly leveraging the company more and more to pay themselves higher and higher salaries and compensation and bonuses and benefits. Now, Simmons Betting is an extreme case, 
of a complete pillaging of the company. But there was nobody to say no. In fact, there weren't even any stockholders. It was a private equity thing. And uh, hopefully, there are people who are out there in um, uh, uh, creditor land who don't buy these bonds anymore and at least look to find out what the money is going for. But that's an example of the way that you effectively allow corporate management to pillage and destroy good companies. Now, not only can that not happen in Germany because of the way the boards are set up, but they, the Germans, in addition, just to make double, double sure that nobody does anything that stupid or destructive, and, I, and I'm leaving aside the fact that they might criminally prosecute people in a way that we don't hear, they also don't allow any deduction for corporate debt. So there's no percentage in taking a solvent company and leveraging it to the hilt, which is what managements have been doing in the United States for the last 20 years, to pay yourself tons of money. I mean, I can't tell you how often this has gone on. I mean, I've seen it as a union side lawyer because I've seen the companies go bankrupt. I mean, people who've been working at these companies 30 years, you know, and the, the companies were fine, they were solvent in like 2002, uh, suddenly the company is bankrupt. It's bankrupt, why? We're selling as much as we ever did, the labor costs, I mean, how are we bankrupt? Oh, well, you know, you got leveraged out of the moon. That kind of stuff can't be stopped with the U.S. corporate model. Is there less of it going on now? I hope so. Uh, but uh, have, do we have any check on it? Dodd-Frank, which is the financial regulation bill, does have something in it right now which allows stockholders and these people in the mutual funds, you know, the stockholder base now is globally dispersed. People aren't paying attention to what goes on in the companies they invest. I mean, are you guys, if you're in a mutual fund, you probably aren't. You probably don't even know what you're investing in. And the fund managers don't particularly care. Um, uh, Dodd-Frank does allow, um, uh, and there are some pension funds that care about this, uh, some of the pension funds, and well, any stockholder, but the pension funds are the more likely to use it, and uh, they're often union controlled, uh, to try to put on a single outside director in some of these companies. But it's, it, while it can happen now that the stockholders can nominate a director for the first time ever, thanks to the new financial reform bill, a huge achievement in the United States. So not a covered at all. Um, it's unclear how often that's going to be used. Partly because unions are disappearing and, and, they're, and they're the ones with the most incentive to put on these outside directors. Yeah. Capitalism? Well, United States and every country is. Right. Are. And I was in Germany for two weeks and I noticed there was like anti capitalism graffiti around Tubington, and I was, I was kind of shocked by that, because I think of capitalism as a good thing. I mean, I'm from the U.S., what do I know? And I'm just curious, I just want your opinion on who that could have came from and why. Oh, well, they have a huge, I, I have omitted mentioning the Lynx Party, which is split from the Social Democrats because they're too capitalist. The Lynx are made up of kids, you know, it's huge university student, and the old East German communists who still won't apologize for shooting people trying to get across the wall and uh, just people who are bitter from the trade unions with the fact that the Germans have cut their pensions and their health care. I mean, they're still huge, but they've cut back because they're smart about competing. So this is a, um, and, and the Germans were kind of, a lot of Germans were hoping that capitalism would collapse. You know, Germans, it's, they don't, even, even the Christian democratic politicians, some of them, not all of them, the free Democrats are completely committed to uh, laissez-faire. They're like the Republicans and the Democrats. The, um, even the Christian Democrats, you, you find people occasionally from some of the states, like Baden-Baden or whatever, who will say, you know, we're not a capitalist country. Well, they are. But they like not to think of themselves as that. Even some of the people on the right, you know, that we're Catholic and we've got this kind of non-capitalist sort of frame of mind. Uh, when I was in Berlin in April 2009, I was in the lefty student part. <clears throat> so, um, and, you know, everything had just gone down the drain uh, worldwide. And Germany took a bigger hit initially, although it's come back much faster because it's got manufacturing. And there was graffiti all over the walls uh, that said, communism, yes, we can. You know, so, um, but it's a 
I, the thing I want to stress about capitalism and socialism is when you hear people talk about European socialism in the United States, what they think about is welfare spending. Our welfare spending, in many ways, is much more out of control than their welfare spending. We're more socialist, in, if, in, if, if you mean wasteful expenditure, than, than the European socialists are, because we're constantly using tax dollars to pay off the private markets and let people walk away with huge profits. Think about the drug companies which is a huge part of our economy. That's all taxpayer money now going to that. Huge profits. I mean, you talk about engineering. We take out the patents. The government pays for the research. Then we license these people with, with stuff that, that was created with taxpayer money. They have monopoly profits off it. They charge whatever they like. We're not allowed to negotiate with them when they give uh, drug prices for elders under Medicare. I mean, it's so ultra-capitalist and ultra-socialistic at the same time that it's hard to untangle it all. Europeans have nothing that abusive or wasteful. But you touch drug spending in this country and you'd have the Tea Party screaming at you in the streets. It doesn't make any sense, does it? So uh, the social, but the thing I wanted to say about European socialism that we don't get and that I, is the one thing I hope you get out of this talk, if you get anything out of this talk, is that in Europe, Socialism is not about the spending, it's about the distribution of power. It's much social democracy, since I don't like the word socialism, since it has a bad connotation, or the socialism part. What is really socialist about Europe, we're more socialist in terms of wasteful spending. What's, uh, we have like 40% of our GDP going into public sector, 41%, they have 47, but they do it much more efficiently. What's really, quote, socialistic about Europe is the redistribution of power to working people. None of that goes on here. And that's the European socialism that we're clueless about. And that's why you know, we read books like Tom Friedman's It's a Flat World, or we listen to Barack Obama say, well, it's all about education, and we don't understand what's really going on in the world. Uh, yeah, wait in the back. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, except I was, I was with a... Uh, Could you repeat the question? Oh, the, uh, what about their campaign finance laws? I was with um, a, just by luck, because uh, a German had read this book and he gave it to this guy who, was a, who knew this Bundestag member who turns out to be on the Foreign Affairs Committee in uh, the Parliament, the Bundestag, uh, and he's, he's like... Um, He's like a Lee Hamilton, if you remember him, the congressman, the Democrat, who was head of the House Foreign Affairs, or uh, he's like the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Bundestag. Uh, and he was at this dinner, and I, by luck, I got to sit next to him. And we were talking about this and that. He, he actually wanted to talk about the novels of Theodore Fontaine, which <laughs> was a little uh, out of my league. But um, he did say that he had been in the, uh, Washington recently, and the congressman had asked him, well, you just went through an election. How much did you have to spend? He said, um, and he was a, it was a very competitive election. He was really fighting hard. He said he spent a total of 60,000 euros. He had to raise 60,000 euros. That's like 70,000 bucks. You know, I, I, that's, uh, we have, it's now $4 million for a congressional race. 70,000 versus 4 million, it's a little different. The political class over there, they don't have rich people coming in from outside, um, and it's much more party-based. So it's very hard when, you know, people just make up their minds about the parties. So the individual selling of, of the candidates doesn't go on to the same way. So when I was there in 1997, I was in Bonn, I met an American journalist, and she said, I, you know, I just can't stand it here. Well, why, why not? Because I'm used to Washington and nobody talks politics in Germany. I said, nobody talks politics, that's all they talk about. You know, I've just gone through these four hour conversations with people, they talk about their health care, their vacation. These are all collective decisions that people make politically, right? On works councils and everything else. And it's part of the whole nation. You know, how much, how many holidays should we have this year? How many this? They talk about it for hours. I, and I, I, I 
I couldn't understand what she meant, not, not talk politics. I've never been in such political conversations in my whole life. And then I re figured out, as we talked more, what she was talking about. She wanted to know, well, you know, Helmut Kohl and, you know, uh, uh, how's his marriage doing? And, you know, are they, uh, is this person coming up against this person? And then, you know, people don't, they, it's all like, over here it's like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama and this and that. They don't talk like that over there. Um, you, know, you know, I was, a, a couple of years ago, there was um, this, survey, you know, done by American journalists of, uh, you know, are, are you for uh, 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 George Bush or are you for Al Gore? And they did the survey of all these journalists at, at Slate Magazine, and they, uh, and they included two of their interns who came from Europe. So all the American journalists say things like, well, I don't trust Bush, uh, and therefore I'm going to say that I'm for Gore. Or they said, uh, Gore is so wooden, you know, Bush is more congenial, and this and that, and blah, 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 across all the way down. Then they got to the two kids who had, were the interns. One was from Australia, and one was from somewhere in Europe. I can't remember what country. I think England. Um, and what did they say? Well, I'm for Gore because he's the Democrat. Or, you know, I'm, that's how they think over there. We don't think that way. So. Sir, I have a question for you, please. Uh, yeah. It's mostly related to engineering. You said that most Germans don't even have a bachelor degree, but yet they're well known for the best engineering. So my question is, what makes their engineering so unique? Well, I would say this. What makes it unique, at least from my perspective as a union side labor lawyer and not an engineer, um, what makes it unique is that there's a huge demand for it. So, one of the things that you see in Germany constantly is we have an engineering shortage. We are desperate. We need more engineers. And I, as I said before, I think that there's this kind of interesting um, problem right now where they've scaled up the workers who came out of the vocational schools to the point that they really should have university degrees as engineers. But the, it's also a product of the fact that they don't have enough engineers in Germany, even though they push engineering like crazy. Um, you know, Germany being Germany, being like any other country, you have so many people who would prefer other softer careers. You know, they might want to teach cultural studies. Uh, so there's a constant shortage, which is a national crisis. There is not a national crisis here in shortage of engineers. There ought to be. There ought to be. But there isn't. Uh, we don't have the newspapers, and you see this routinely in Germany. What are we going to do about our engineering shortage? What are we going to do about our engineering shortage? When was the last time you saw a story like that in a major US paper? Um, what I would say makes them unique is that they have an institutional commitment to it, and they have a commitment to it because that's how they stay competitive, given that they aren't going to financialize their economy. They're not going to outsource everything to the um, uh, uh, low-wage countries. They're going to focus on manufacturing. They're going to stay green and not consume. They're going to be committed to exporting stuff. So they have all these institutional mechanisms that push them into keeping a manufacturing culture that is inevitably dependent upon technology, which means it's inevitably dependent upon engineering, you know, and the Americans are constantly telling the Germans to lay off. Don't push this so hard. Push more into consumption, not into manufacturing. Stop putting all this effort into it. As one SPD, this is a left-wing guy, official said to me, why would we cut ourselves off from the most dynamic parts of the economy? Why would we do what the Americans say which is focus less on technology. Why would we do that? You wouldn't do that if you're trying to run a balance of trade and trying to keep your country out of debt. But in the United States, we don't give a fig about that. So that's why engineers in this country don't have the prestige that they have in Germany. And that's why there is no national crisis here about an engineering shortage. You may have noticed. Yeah. Uh, 
And to go on a little bit uh, more on education, do you think that do you think that somehow nowadays education is overrated to the point that now it's more about more handing out diplomas, bachelors and masters than true education itself, more formation for the of the students or the people? Do you think that? You mean in Germany or the United States? I'm sorry. I mean here in the US. US pretty much oh. pretty much in the US education has lost its true essence of the education to more of ending out diplomas, masters and bachelors as opposed to formation. Hey, I, I'm here as a guest of the university. I'm not going to knock American education. So, uh, but um, I, I, I'll say this. I think that we uh, need to have a bigger focus in this country on uh, engineering, manufacturing, technology, the most dynamic parts of the economy, and not uh, simply this view, which goes back to Robert Reich, which is just send everybody to college and uh, uh, turn them into symbolic analysts and have them manipulate pa paper on Wall Street and everything will be okay. It's not okay. I, you know, Reich, to his credit, has backed away from these views, but back when I was getting really annoyed with him back in the early 1990s, he and Clinton were pushing this sort of uh, notion. Uh, I, I think that we have, I think that we put too many resources in education in the country. I don't think the Germans put enough. I also think that it's extremely important in holding a country together in a solidaristic way, if I may use that multisyllabic word, it's extremely important that you give people a sense that their lives are not over just because they have a high school degree. I think the most incredible thing about the German socialism and what really makes it socialist is that you have people with high school degrees sitting on corporate boards. And we have people coming out of college with huge amounts of student debt who can't get decent jobs. And in our inner cities, we tell kids from the day they walk in there, not literally, but in all sorts of ways, that if they aren't going to college, which most of them aren't, their lives are over. So then we wonder why the test scores aren't very good at, at, at these schools. Hey, there's no hope. Until Barack Obama and the Democratic Party and Joe Biden and all the rest of them, until they decide that they've got to create a country where a high school degree means something, I think you know, we're writing off 75% of the country, and we always will. Hi, um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Good. Um, I've worked in the transportation planning field, and um, one of my favorite stats about Germany is that the number of trips made by bicycle to run errands increases with age. So I figure I, I need to learn German because I'd like to retire there, obviously, because that sounds better than having people drive me around everywhere when I'm older. But um, I'm really happy to see how in the U.S. we have more bike and ped facilities coming up, transit, public transit's becoming more popular. Do you see <clears throat> transportation modes um, reinforcing the German ethic of um, how they structure their economy, how they consume less? Do you think that the U.S. could start to consume less if they start getting out of their cars? Uh, yes. The question is, will we consume less if we get out of our cars? I think so. Uh, but the, uh, um, for one thing, uh, being in the car is a form of consumption. So, for example, my brother, who is this manufacturer's rep and wanted to come to Iowa today and drove me uh, down to Cedar Rapids, where we ate at the Irish Democrat for lunch, uh, lives uh, in the suburbs of Chicago. It took me about an hour to get there. Um, uh, to his place of business, uh, which is out in Oak Brook, because the traffic was so horrible. And I take the L to work every day, and I just came, I, I was ready to break down and cry. You know, I, just awful. And he said to me, well, you don't understand how the rest of the world lives. This is what we do every day. I don't understand how this can go on. But I sure understand how it pumps up GDP per capita because just think of all the gas I burned up, all the congestion, uh, the cars wearing out, uh, 
and 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 the fact that you have to get into the car late at night and go out uh, and fight traffic and get on the interstate to go get uh, aspirin from a Walgreens is just kind of jaw-dropping. Um, we're used to it. We accept it. But the amount of, you know, you look at the GDP per capita of Germany and the US, you take out all the stuff that involves bad public goods because people are moving out to the suburbs because the public schools are collapsing in the inner city, so they have to move farther and farther out, and the commutes are longer and longer. And people, my God, people are actually commuting into Chicago from the Mississippi River now, you know, because they want to get out to good schools, et cetera. If you throw in that, if you throw in the uh, uh, mauling of America, if you throw in the creation of all this new uh, real estate stuff where the Germans' forests are still pristine and we've, we've paved over everything, well, of course our GDP per capita is, is higher. There's so much fraud, there's so much waste, uh, there's so much gambling in the US, uh, all of which adds to GDP per capita and which the Europeans don't do. It's just, uh, and, and it, would be, it would be bad enough if we could afford this consumption but we're running a huge trade deficit. We're running a huge trade deficit. It's like $50 billion a month. And it's all because people are out there spending all this like there's no tomorrow. And, 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 and then they wonder why the US is in debt. You know, we have the Tea Party marching. Oh, yeah, we've got the government in debt. Well, you know, uh, if, if you're running a huge deficit of like $700 billion every year, there are two things that are going to happen. Either the private sector is going to go into debt, which we did under Bush, or the public sector is going to go into debt. Somebody's got to pay the bill, but that doesn't seem to have come across to anybody in this country. Oh, uh, the federal government's got to cut spending. Well, uh, who's going to pay the bill? Who's, who's going to pay enough to bring up the country to full employment and pay <coughs> all these deficits which we have to pay when we pump the country up to 4% unemployment. It's got to come out of debt. Your debt individually, MasterCard debt, mortgage debt, government fiscal debt. Somebody's got to go into debt to pay our way in the world. And that's all because of this crazy focus on consumption, burning up of gasoline, mulling of the country, um, and, and, and it's exactly why the Europeans are ahead of us. They aren't in debt. Okay, so you talked about um, <clears throat> how the Germans don't outsource everything, and uh, you have manufacturing culture, focus more on technology. Uh, there's a country about 25 years ago that did that, uh, Japan. Uh, where they had immaculate factories, uh, they focused less on consuming. Uh, I still think nowadays 50% uh, of their paychecks are saved. I don't know so much about investing. Can, do you foresee Germany experiencing any of the problems that Japan's having right now with their banking system and their, con and their currency and sort of, uh, sort of the differences that Germany's not doing that Japan uh, is witnessing? Wow, that's a huge question. It's outside my ken. Um, you know, the analogy today is between the United States and Japan, not Germany and Japan. And um, the reason is that uh, the Germans have never had any kind of bubble economy the way the Japanese did in real estate. Uh, they never had the kind of um, um, collapse of the financial sector. Now, it could happen um, because of the euro and because of the fact that the Germans are the guarantors, ultimately, of the Greek debt, the Irish debt, and so forth. But let me tell you one big difference between US, Japan, and Germany. Today, as I was driving, there's a little report in Chicago uh, radio. Uh, they it was in the Tribune today, one-third of the homes in Chicago are, quote, underwater. Not underwater like Ames was last summer, but underwater in the sense that the 
owners of those homes owe more to the banks than the homes are worth total fair market value. That means the banks have huge problems. Now, German banks have that problem because they invested in a lot of the collateral debt obligations of the United States. But there's nothing like that in the German economy. I mean, no home is underwater. I don't want to say no home, but, but there was no bubble. What happened in Spain, bubble. What happened in Ireland, bubble. Lots of loans going out. I mean, the Germans didn't go into debt. Japan, same way, huge real estate uh, thing. So uh, it collapsed. People owed more than the homes were worth and anything. And what does that mean? Well, it's bad for the people. It's terrible. You know, we think about the homeowners, how sad for them. But the people it's really bad for are the banks. So the Japanese banks just struggled for years with no money. So they couldn't uh, lend anything. Uh, Germany doesn't have that problem. Nobody is underwater. So they, they have the collateral after effects of the United States. But if the United States, if the German banks are in trouble, it's only because the United States are in much, much bigger trouble. And that's what's scary. Plus, the Germans have tons of savings. And <clears throat> the Germans don't have to go into debt to stimulate the economy because they aren't consuming at the same level that the Japanese were. But more important, they have this enormous stimulus that is, you know, Paul Krugman is saying, why don't the Germans go into uh, debt to stimulate the economy? Well, they've got, they've got stimulus coming in from abroad. I mean, everybody is buying their goods. So that's, they don't need a lot of demand at home. Uh, they don't need to go into debt to create jobs because they've got Brazil and China buying this stuff. And that is very helpful to a country that is already sitting on a huge pile of savings, has great markets that are opening up new all the time. I mean, the Germans have more markets that are coming open every day because all these countries in South America have reached a level where they're looking for the kind of things that the Germans are selling, China, India. I mean, we ought to be providing that, but the Germans are providing it. And that's why I don't think they'll run into the troubles that we have. But I don't understand all the ramifications of what's happened in Ireland and how that, and, and even Britain and how, and Portugal and the so-called pigs, the countries of Portugal, Irish, um, uh, Greece, um, how that is Spain, how that is going to play in the German financial market. So I'm punting on your question, but I'm not, I don't think it's gonna be bad for the Germans. I think we'll wrap it up here, Tom. Thank you very much for a stimulating sure. evening. Thanks for coming by.